why I do what I do here. This is a big of love for us. But I run an advisory firm for CEOs and founders specifically to help them uh, curate a business that becomes scalable and sought after. I love working with experts because the thing is, people are very good at what they do and specifically who they do it for. A lot of times the business part is a little difficult, right? There's, you know, um, either if you're lean or if you have a team, the word overwhelm comes up a lot, right? And part of it, and I'm going to share a little bit of a history of where the unique method and all that came from, but it's about overwhelm that comes a lot from not having clarity or alignment or understanding where your vision is really trying to take you. And so I'm going to actually first ask you to close your eyes. That's what I do. Um, and I want you to imagine something for me. Imagine a time when you wake up in the morning and feel completely aligned to your brand and business. It represents your core values. It represents your why. It provides you motivation and drive to want to tackle that next opportunity, next partnership, next contract, next opportunity. You have identified your target audience. You are clear on your niche. Your ideal client, you know your ideal client's pain points and it aligns to the solutions or capabilities that you're uniquely able to provide and deliver. You've been able to consistently deliver on time, on budget, whatever that looks like, but exceed their expectations. Your marketing and your, your plans are on point, your funnels are on point, you wake up really excited and freaking aligned to who you are because you're playing to your strengths in business. Open your eyes. That's the goal, right? We're all entrepreneurs trying to make a big difference in this world, right? You're trying to solve problems at the end of the day. This is a quote that I live by. You know, um, people call us the 1%, the crazy, uh, you know, to go out on your own and do what you gotta do, but entrepreneurship is living a life, like uh, living a few years of your life like most people won't, so you can spend the rest of your life like most people can't, right? And just think about that for a second. Um, this week is just a case of day for me. Literally, we haven't slept in five days. Why am I doing it? Because I'm happy. Right? And that's what I want for you guys, because sometimes you fall out of love with your business. It becomes another sort of thing to do versus, wow, this is the reason I actually did it. This is who I need to be serving. This is how I'm making money. And I really enjoy it and align, align to it. So as I said, I'm the founder of Disruptive CEO. I'm also the creator of the Unique Method, which I'm going to go through parts of it. It's a lot. It's like I teach some accelerators. I do larger engagements around this stuff. So I'm going to tell, teach you some of the foundations and just give you some questions to start probing thoughts for you as you're thinking about your own strategy, your own vision. Um, of course, Cora and I just start a weekend. I'm a mom. I have an 8-year-old and a 12-year-old and two puppies and a husband and in-laws and all that. I'm human, like all of you guys. <laughs> Um, I've been serving and doing this for a very long time, hundreds of companies, hundreds of founders. Um, the methodology has really started to gain some traction. I'm actually getting it validated now by uh, the university so I can write the book and start to scale it, like the lean methodology on one side, um, and uh, you know, entrepreneurial operating system is the middle point, which I'll actually speak about with you. Um, here's a quick story, you know, the uh, reason why I do what I do, had a quarter to like 14th, 15th Street, 16th Street. Paris owned the first Indian vegetarian restaurant in Washington, D.C. after coming from India with literally nothing, one of those things, right? Ended up doing really, really well until um, the mid-90s when they went close to bankruptcy and everything changed. Everything changed. We went from sort of being that pioneers. I watched my dad have this, used to have this swag and confidence to like getting depressed, right? And I realized at a young age that when you're an entrepreneur, when you're a CEO, when you're aligned to your work, you're at a whole different level of confidence, a whole new different level of swag. But we know the statistics in business, guys. It's real, right? Um, and so what happens a lot of times is there is this like effect on relationships and life and health and all this stuff. And so I actually, I kept that, I studied figured out for a long time like why businesses fail, why they succeed. It became a passion of mine, but I decided to leave everything entrepreneurship and go to New York. I wanted to be a Fortune 500 CMO, spent 13 years at Prudential, 
uh, did well there, um, and learned a lot of lessons about entrepreneurship in corporate America, which was kind of crazy. But I spent um, a couple years with 2,500 financial planners. They're, they look like everybody else, right? There are so many of them. My job was, how do you make them unique and different in the marketplace, right? How do you help them scale their businesses? The second thing I did there was work on the entire rebrand with all the chief marketing officers. So I took a 136-year-old company who was known for insurance, but they were doing so much more. Just like you guys, that's a company, right? A big one, I get it. But a lot of times as entrepreneurs, we're working in our business so much, but it's hard to take the time to actually tell people who we, who we are today, because you've evolved, right? I learned a lot of lessons through that process. I was doing really well uh, underneath the CMO. I was climbing the lab ranks. When I was 36, I'm 45 now, I will be 45 in December. 36, I had one of two uh, of a pulmonary embolism. That's a funny picture because the only one I have in the hospital because I all I kept thinking about was going back to work. That was my mindset at that time. Uh, almost died twice in a week. Pretty crazy between both of my kids. Uh, and it shifted my life completely. I, uh, my priorities shifted. Many, many of you maybe during COVID had the same sort of pause, right? It's like, what, what really matters? Uh, and then about a year later, I decided to go out on my own Worked in two health and wellness startups, and now I've been working with lean CEOs to major teams. Um, and over the last couple of years, with the 20-some years of experience, I've come up with the methodology that, again, I'm going to share with you. Some, I'm not going to lie. Some of this can be overwhelming, all right? Because to get clear, you have to ask the right questions. And, I, and to be very honest with you, I've also been working really hard on this conference where I was like, okay, I wanted to refine this to that perfect T, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend time on three concepts of the six with you guys today. This is, takes time, again, yeah, but at least I'll start to get you thinking differently. So this is perfect, uh, this concept, it works really well for service-based companies. It can work for product too, but it really works better for service. You've had some traction. Three years minimum, or at least those 10,000 hours. You're an expert in what you do. That's really important in this process because before, when you first start in business, you're guessing, right? Everything is about revenue coming in the door, whatever it takes, right? This process works best when you have data, when you work with some folks, right? Where you're like, okay, I've learned about the market. I've learned about myself. I've learned about my team. Um, and you're really focused on differentiating yourself in the marketplace, trying to be unique and different, right? A lot of times in business, we have multiple focuses. When opportunity arises, it's like, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it, sure, my team could do it, but then all of a sudden, you're doing too much. And that's also where the overwhelm can come from, right? So then, I ask you to commit with me today. I just want you to be present. I want you to take the notes. I want you to take it in. I share with you. Some of this may be overwhelming, but that's okay. I'm here later. We'll talk about it, whatever it takes, right? But these are the important strategic decisions that you need to start to think about within your business scale. So some of you are here, you may be earlier, uh, and you're trying to gain traction, or you're a ladder in your business, and you know, you're somewhere in the middle. But let's talk um, about the market for a second. This is a $2 trillion market, professional services in general. It's kind of crazy, $2 trillion. But if you know the statistics, most people are making less than $50,000 in this market. It's kind of crazy, right? And this is actually what I wanted to share more is this evolution of an entrepreneur. In the beginning, you're focused on launching, trying to figure it out, speaking to everyone, doing what you gotta do. Over the next couple of years, you're gonna learn. You're gonna, you're gonna potentially pivot. It's part of the process. You should pivot. You have to go and learn from what you or learn. I mean, learn from what you learn. Yeah, you should learn from what you learn. <laughs> like, yeah. I think that's bad. I'm sorry. Um, but you will gain traction. The more you're out there, the more you put yourself out there. In some capacity, you're going to get clients. It may not be the right clients all the time. They may not be the perfect, like oh, uh, even beta clients sometimes. But you're going to learn through that process. And if this was just the world that we live in, you should be thinking about like strategically, okay, what, what work, what did it, where do I, like, what, what decisions do I need to make to really keep going and grow? This is not, this is not real. This is real, right? And I normally have a picture of this woman who's like pulling her hair out. This is a fun, fun meme, I think she's seen it a couple times. 
Because entrepreneurship is like this, right? Who knew COVID was going to happen? Who knew medical problems were going to happen? Who knew a lot of things, right? And then there are all these statistics. Eight out of 10 businesses fail in their first 18 to 24 months. Half of them fail at five years. You know, and I kept studying. I was like, who are, who's surviving? Like, what are they doing that's different, right? And so 20 years of experience, et cetera, et cetera, and this is what I have learned. All businesses evolve. Where you are when you first start is like throwing spaghetti against the wall. <laughs> Where you end up, now those are the decisions that we need to make, right? I have a slide at the end that will bring this to life a little bit more, but this is like the five reasons that I kept seeing why entrepreneurs in general and founders would hold themselves back from making very clear strategic decisions for clear guidance within their own businesses. The first one is you, they try to be everything to everyone and they stay that way. And again, in the beginning, you kind of have to do that. You don't know what you don't know, but there comes a time where you have to analyze and be like, wow, these are the people that we serve best, right? And the problem is there's a fear of missing out. Oh man, there's a $50,000 contract. Or what if I said yes? Guess what happens? You start going like this and it becomes unscalable. Right? The second is you do not understand what their ideal client actually values. So how many of you, just raise your hand, let's be real, how many of you made assumptions about your clients or your prospects? You're just like, I went through it, so of course they're going to go through it. But that's not how business works. Right? You really do, when they talk about customer discovery and interviews and focus groups, like you got to, there's different ways of doing it these days. But it's really important that you don't base your offers on your own assumptions. Right? Too many focuses, we chatted about that, right? You get opportunity as you gain traction, all of a sudden, people don't know what you stand for. This is a big one. Working with too many unideal clients will make you hate your business. This is another big one. You see how this keeps going, right? Because all of a sudden you're like, oh, I can take that guy or girl or business, and then they're like, they, they may value what you do in some capacity, but they don't value the transformation you provide. You look like another commodity to them. So all of a sudden you're just a service provider. You are not the expert coming in to help them support the transformation that they need. That's what they're looking at you, and that's how they're going to treat you. And you're going to feel like shit. They're going to feel like shit. They're not going to pay you that much money. And it just starts to be cyclical. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do, right? But again, this point, this whole point, this whole presentation is about being more strategic, right? Uh, but your brand, this is the last one, your brand, again, you're working so hard in your business that I don't know if I'm, I'm uh, aging myself, but that's a. Uh, there you go, thank you. <laughs> and normally there's like a red dot somewhere in the middle of that. And, you know, you look, it's like the sea of sameness, right? So you look like it, even though you know you're different, even though you know you're unique, you've worked really hard, but that's what drives me every day, right? But it frustrates me because that's not what happens, right? And this is what I realized, my realization is successful business organizations evolve, but they're being intentional when they get to focus, when they when they were focused on growth, they're being intentional, they're making decisions intentionally. That's what I've learned. And so they go in this path of a market out there for them. They're looking for a transformation. They're, look, they're not looking for features and services. I'm not looking for a website. I'm, the, I'm looking for something that's gonna help me convert my clients in X, Y, and Z way. Be the transformation. You guys have that level of expertise. Be the transformation that your ideal client seeks. I think that's like a Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi book that I just read in the Okay, here's a couple, I'm just, there's gonna be a ton of use cases, ton of, ton of examples, just to give you guys more perspective, right? This is, uh, have you ever been on the uh, website Wayback, Wayback Machine? Yeah. I love that website, because it tells you the truth about everyone's business. <laughs> Everyone has evolved. It's called, you're going to get Google it, it's not actually waybackmachine.com, but it is some weird one, but if you put Wayback Machine in Google, it will show you. So if you put like google.com from back in the day or something, whatever, it will show you screenshots of the, their website 10 years ago. So uh, this is actually, uh, EYA is a develop, real estate development firm locally, and they're 20, 15 years ago, or whatever, they look like everybody else. Look on the left, it was just like, hey, we do development in DC, we build buildings, we sell them residentially. Over time,
time, they figured out the strategy, they realized where they played at their best, they did the homework for competitors, and they said, you know what, our ideal client are the people who like walkability. So all the city, the city people who want to move to suburbia, we're going to create these communities that have restaurants and bars near them and communities, so they feel like they're still in the city, but they're in suburbia. That's all they do, and they do it really well. And they get asked to do that, you know? And of course they have like little different capabilities and other things, but that's what they're known for, right? And that's very differentiating and unique compared to so many others in the marketplace. This is another one, uh, Yellowtail Training. I know the CEO founder really well. When he first started, he created this Linksys training program in person with COVID came change. All of a sudden he realized he could do these programs online but he realized that I, he, he, over the years, it was six years, I think, in his business, that he's trained, I think it was over, I don't know, 1,500 people in that program. And he said, you know what, our focus is going, um, people who do not have IT backgrounds, the way that they were creating this programming was like, we'll, we'll give them the training, they'll go through the program, and we're getting them a $100,000 job. And he created that whole transformation for them. He's like one of the number two training agencies in the world, or in the country right now, because he got very clear on who he serves, how he does it, how he does it differently, and the transformation. People are not just trying to get certified. They're looking for the 100K job. He, he owned that. That's the transformation they're seeking. So I was looking at, okay, our founders are seeking an easier way to make this more intentional, systematic, create some strategic clarity. And this is what I kept seeing. I was like, there's a gap in our models, our frameworks. We had the business model canvas and the lean startup right before this, before me, there was somebody talking about from GW, he's a lean startup expert. And it's all great for early stage. And then when people think about scale, they think about people, process, technology. Obviously important. But where's that moment, that inflection point that you're saying, you know what, what's working in my business model? And then how do I align that to my brand messaging? Because if I don't, people actually don't know what you stand for in the marketplace. And if you don't fix your business model to who you serve best, you're gonna keep doing everything like status quo and you're either gonna stay stagnant or it's just going to continue to build on this like, uh, sort of a little bit of a vicious cycle. And, the, and the, so this is where I see the biggest inflection point and that's where the unique method was born. So um, unique method is six, strategic steps specifically to help you think about how to become scalable and sought after in the market. And the next page has the method, take a picture of it, it's a lot of words, but it's intentional because I wanted you to take a picture. And I'm going to explain it in a, as much as I can for a second here. U and I, Q, U, E all has a meaning. U and I is what I consider your unique indicators. And we're gonna go through the first three in a little bit more depth today. Um, and then I'm gonna share why it matters. So how many of you have kind of been like, oh my God, I gotta get my content, my thought leadership out, and da da da, and I'm not showing up, and I have all this stuff to do. But then for a part of me is like, okay, well, what are you trying to put out, right? And so when you're clear on your, so we're gonna get deeper into your unicorn vision. When you're in service, uh, in the service industry, we don't always talk about vision in a big way, but when you start to understand that you can impact a lot of people for what you do and start putting numbers and bigger visions in there, things will start to shift for you. So unicorn vision is sort of, it's supposed to be strategic and visionary at the same time and inspirational. Niche positioning, we're gonna go deep into today. I actually, you know how people are like, who's your ideal client, who's your ideal client? I always start with, who's your unideal client? Let's get clear there first. Who are the people that you want to repel, right? Because that you should no longer be attracting them. Your messaging needs to be focused on uh, speaking to their actual ideal clients. So we're going to go deeper into who you are, like where you play your strengths within your niche. I stands for intellectual property. Another way to say it is your your, into, uh, your intellect packaged, your intelligence packaged. You have years of experience, guys. How, you know, your teams have years of experience, you've been working with clients, how do we now package that in a way that showcases a transformation that you can provide uniquely to your ideal client? So when you get clear on you and I, 
trust me, there will be so much more alignment in your company. I, and I'm gonna show you use case after use case of things I've worked on. But now, all of a sudden, on the right are your unique amplifiers. So now, if you're clear on who you are, what you do, who you serve best, how you do it uniquely and differently, then go out and build qualifications and thought leadership around it. Then let's unify your brand messaging. And then let's get very clear what I consider E, enrolling your niche network, is your organic marketing strategy, which is about strategic partnerships. And this is a huge one for scaling, especially organically. It's like, who is it that you can cultivate relationships with that there's mutual capital? Not one way. Not like, hey, I'll give you a commission if you blah, blah, blah. It's like you're, you share the same ideal clients, you're working together, you have the same value systems. All you need is five or six really smart, strong partnerships, and you can really scale together. Okay. So, um, at a high level, you know, why is this work important? You know, and it's up to you, right? These are decisions that CEOs and founders have to make. You could call me total BS, it doesn't work for you. I'm good with that, because I'm just sharing you what I know, what I've seen over and over again. Because the danger of serving more unideal clients, I'm telling you, your work becomes more project-based because they start asking you for all these things that are not scalable, right? Unless you're early stage, guys, that's why it's important for you to understand. This has to be coming from a place where you've had experience. Danger of scaling without intention means that you start to fall out of love with your, with that, with your business, right? And the danger of wrong execution is basically you're working on things that um, customers are unsatisfied, your reputation gets hurt, and you don't make a lot of money, right? So um, the, I, I try to explain this a lot, but the unique method is not a, just a marketing and branding exercise. It's a strategic exercise. Please take another picture of this. This is another one that I put a lot of words intentionally because you can start to see how each one of those you, um, pieces of the unique method starts to correlate in a core question. And this stuff takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. You know how it goes. These are real decisions you have to make. But this is the one thing I wanted to share here as well. And what I would ask you is it's time for you to give yourself permission to stop throwing spaghetti against the wall. All right, so the proof is in the pudding. So I'm gonna give you a couple examples, and then we're gonna go into a couple of the concepts a little deeper, and I'm gonna ask you to do some work with me. So um, the first case study I'm gonna go through is this concept where um, this company, uh, this is a property, uh, they're developers and a property manager, so this is what they did. They were trying to serve everybody. They initially, again, yeah, way back machine, they went into Philadelphia and Baltimore, and they were trying to go into um, things called Type B and Type C type uh, houses and remodel them and just sell them to customers. Go in, buy them low, remodel, flipping. This is basically the flipping game. They realized over time that their audience really was, uh, they, they had collected this international audience of investors, right, through some relationships or whatever. And what they were actually looking for was a turnkey approach for investment in real estate. So they created a system that went from, okay, we're not just you know, flipping houses for other people. We're focused on finding the house, remodeling it, uh, uh, selling it to the customer, and actually doing the property management, finding a tenant for them. And they called it the turnkey property pro. And it made them so unique. They got a ton of PR, ton of clients, but now their process became seamless. Talk about IP, your, your intellectual property. They use their process as a way to focus on the transformation that that international client was seeking. They're not here. They needed somebody to do this for them. So that's what they focused on, right? Now everything that they were doing for PR, thought leadership, their brand was all focused on that audience. They did really well, really, really well when they got clear. Second one. How many can, when I say referrals can kill your business, do you understand what that means? Do you agree with me? I need more context. There, okay, that's fair. <laughs> okay, what do you do? I run a brand strategy agency and we drive positive human connections through the power of creative and brand strategy. Who do you serve? Primarily entertainers and brands in the music industry, but after this class, we're refining. Well, that's okay, but pretend, okay, entertainers, brand in the music industry. I brought you a shoe client. Or I bought you, hey, and maybe their entertainment industry could be combined. Maybe that's not the best idea. A construction client. 
You see what I'm saying? And it's like, it, what the whole point is that referrals will kill your business if they're the wrong referrals. People, and this is what I'm telling you, without clarity yourself on who you are, what you do, who you serve best, the people who are giving you referrals are being so good intended. They just want to help. But trust me, when you get on that discovery call and you're talking, and you're like, shit, like, I can't, this is not my client. <laughs> oh my god. Like, like, you know, it's annoying. Maybe you have some, you know, affiliate opportunities with referrals that could be good, but referrals can truly kill your business because a lot of times you say yes anyway. That's why. You say yes anyway. And that takes away from scalability. This is a really prime example. Uh, I love this client. They're amazing. Ten years. Uh, they've been in the management consulting phase. They're out in the UK. Um, they are uh, a group. I think there are about 25 of them now. Um, but when I met them, you know, look at their website. It doesn't matter visually. I'm not a visual identity person. But the, my point of showing this to you was they were going out trying to compete with like the big five. Ma you know, management consulting firm. So what is that? Deloitte, all those guys, right? And the reality is when I started talking to them, we went through the unique method with them, they actually were experts in operations. That's all they did. They did it really well in operational excellence and like a couple key areas. We changed their entire model. We focused on what they do, which is deliver excellence with certainty. Their entire team is singing the same music right now. And that's really amazing to see. Right? They're, the way that they go to market, why I said with this one, girls kill their business, they were siloed in three different departments. The people who actually worked in one of their departments only knew them for that. They didn't realize they were a larger company that did consulting in X and X and X, right? So this is just a, like a concept of like, you could be working in your business and you may have teams, they may be talking about your business completely different than you are. Guess how that's gonna impact you? <laughs> People are not going to understand who you are, what you do, in a unified way. The third example is selling features makes you a commodity, selling transformation makes you a Sherpa. Uh, this is actually another one of my favorite clients. This is a 36-year-old nonprofit called Podespa, based out of Spain. The honorary president is the king of Spain. I got to meet him earlier this year. It was pretty crazy. Um, he, I'm not he, he was a part of the process. <laughs> But this organization has been alleviating poverty for 36 years. I was on their board, and I couldn't, un like the way that they would explain what they did was so project focused and not in a holistic way of like um, emphasizing that they're a nonprofit, uh, they, but they look like everybody else to me until we dug deep into who they are, what they did, their, you know, their data and clients. And specifically in this one, they had a specific methodology that truly alleviates poverty in the most vulnerable places in the world. And then we coined it the coin method. Talk about IP, right? So what I want you guys to start to think about in your own businesses. Now when they go pitch or they're creating partnerships with the UN or doing all these things, they have a very distinctive model compared to other uh, organizations, right? And it's much easier to say they're a good fit or they're not, right? got much clearer on the way that they're focused on their target audiences. It's a very different organization today. It also works when you're a lean, one-person show. That's the beauty of this company, right? This is Melina Melhani. I met her five years ago. She's been uh, a nutritionist for 15 years, worked in nutrition startups, all this stuff. When she created her brand, now she has over 90,000 people on Instagram. Okay, she's not a small feat. She's like a ambassador for nutrition and all this stuff. But she was trying to go out to the market as a generalist. And I said, no, let's go focus on what you're very good at. What do you care about? What is it, the experience that you've had? And she had a little bit of a different eclectic experience, but her focus was on picky eating, kids. And she got asked to write a book specifically on baby led weaning, which is like you know trying to get the kids, the babies to eat, whatever. She has built such an incredible following, multiple programs under her brand. It became that much easier because people knew what to go to her for instead of, hey, I can get people to lose weight. I can get people to do this. She found her niche, right? So um, she's in everything. That's what that's amazing. Um, OK, and the last one I think I want to show you right now is Medici. So Medici, Let's Talk Payments was the original brand. Um, and Let's Talk Payments was the first FinTech blog. I think they had a million hits the first year when FinTech came out years ago. And when I got involved, I actually ended up being a fractional CMO for a while. But um, they, they were actually a very different company. They were not just media. Again, you start going deeper into
of who you are, what you do. They have a whole consulting arm. Anyway, we got them very clear on all the key pieces of the unique method. Last year, they were sold to a company. They did really well because they got clear, right? So this stuff has a lot of results, right? It starts to impact the way you speak about your company. It starts to impact how you attract your ideal client. It starts to impact the money that comes in the door. And if you have any goals for strategic exits and other things, that's what now you, when you're enrolling people, you know who to go after, right? Or you're partnering with people, you know the right people to start to bring on because you're clear on your own uh, core capabilities and where you play your strength. So the question I'm sure you're sitting here, oh, that's cool, Seema, what about us? What about me? What does this look like? How do you get here? So I need you to first to change your mindset for me because when we first build our businesses, we really focus on creating a brand for ourselves, right? It's like, this is how we show up. A lot of ego also comes into this. We wanna be that brand. It could be our individual brand, it could be a team brand, whatever it is. In this stage, if you're at an inflection point, start thinking about building your business and your brand for your ideal client, right? Shift it. You have to speak to them. Your model, your offers have to be what they're looking for, almost like you're answering their prayers. That's the goal, right? I want you to do me a favor. This is just a little in the steps. Go to the person next to you and tell them what you do, who you do best for, what problem you solve, how you do uniquely, and why you versus anyone else. Go for it. 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and I'm going to tell you this. Alright, no judgment. 
Does your brand today represent who your business is? Yes or no? Quick question. Yes or no? Is maybe an option. Maybe is not an option. It's yes or no. So maybe is no. Are you known in the market for what you do well? What you do well? Yes or no? Are you clear in your ideal client persona? We may switch that up after this one. Are you clear on the pain points you solve for your ideal client? Are you clear on the transformation you provide your ideal client? Not the teachers, not the product, the transformation. Are you clear on who you no longer want to attract? Yes. Hence your unideal client. Are you clear on that? Are you currently playing to your strengths in your business? Clear on your own superpower, your specialized knowledge, your zone of genius? Yours or your team's together. Do your do your ideal clients, this is a big one, value what you bring to the table. Okay, this is a big one. Okay, think about it. Do they see you as a nice to have versus a need to have? It's a very big difference in business when your position is something that's a nice to have. They won't make those decisions that quick. So are you, you know, again, this is why your ideal client is so important. All right, so add them up. Um, if you have more yeses than no, there's an opportunity to validate and optimize. If you have more no's, there's an opportunity to reconcile. There is no judgment. This is just for you, okay? It's very, very normal. It doesn't matter each way. So I'm going to go through three of uh, um, the unique, the UNI, this is like a much deeper, deeper thing that when I go through, I have a 10 week accelerator program that I work with CEOs on to help them really understand these concepts, their tools and other things. This is just high level for you guys right now. So the unique indicators within the unique are the unicorn vision, niche positioning and intellectual property, right? So this is just a reminder, you've already taken a picture, I'm gonna move on. Um, have you ever seen this quote from um, Steve Jobs, right? So when you are working on something that you truly care about, nobody has to push you, your vision simply pulls you, right? And again, I think you guys know, right? Entrepreneurship is not easy. <laughs> so I have a slide coming up, but it really speaks to like those days that you don't want to get out of bed. Like you need something to motivate you because you know, I'm on a mission to like help 100,000 entrepreneurs go through this methodology. I, if I help them, they will help millions more. I already know that, right? I'm very clear on that. That motivates me, right? What motivates you? That's what we have to figure out. How do you align it to your business, right? If you're just building a software product or this, that, and the other, that's good. But try to get deep within yourself. Why did you even start that? What is the bigger problem you're solving for? Why do you care? Right? So when, why is the word unicorn in front of vision? Because I, uh, I would always like, oh, here's a unicorn company being sold. I'm like, that's cool, but unicorns are, you know, fancy animals. Uh, and my little kids like them. But like, when I looked up, it was the first time I looked up unicorn, actually. And it said something that is highly desirable but difficult to find or obtain. For me, that's inspirational. And the point of this is it's not just about inspiring you. It's about creating a strategic framework for you to say yes to opportunities and no to opportunities. Again, if we had a way deeper class, you were part of my programs, we'd go deeper into what that looks like. But at a high level, you know, these are just prompts, like a world where a leader, I want to become the leader, redefine the industry. You know, I have people who are uh, nutritionists who are redefining their approach to diabetes because they have an integrated approach that other people do not use. It's very personal, right? But they know because they're experts in what they do. So when you commit to your vision, this is what I was sharing earlier, those days that you want to jump out of bed, you jump out of bed, you say no to things that don't support you getting one closer to the end game. That means, you know, sometimes those parties or whatever it may be, right? You're making sacrifices being an entrepreneur. 
I have my niece's wedding that I'm not going to today because I'm here, right? I'm going to this session. But you keep going no matter what. It will help you break boundaries in your business, right? Are you guys familiar with Simon Sinek? I'm gonna, I hope I can play this. Hold on, let me see if I can play this. This is just 30 seconds. Uh, it's like one minute. They come. The far destination that you're pursuing, then you can adapt much more easily. So let's let's take a, a silly analogy. Let's say you live on the East Coast and you want to go to the West Coast. You pick a route, you pick a, a highway, you pick a, a road, and you make your way towards where you're, you're going. Um, now, all of a sudden, there's a car accident, and there's a blockage, and everything comes to a grinding halt. You have options. You can either sit in the traffic, or you can take the first exit and take a slower, more meandering road, but you're still going in the basic same direction. Companies with vision, that's like having a destination. They are able to pivot, go sideways, go around, go slower, go on small roads, but they have a basic sense that they're moving in the same and right direction. Companies without vision, companies without a sense of the infinite uh, road ahead, um, uh, they're going to sit there and panic. We're not moving, we're not going, and if they do take a side road, they'll have no idea which one to take or which direction to go in. Um, and so that infinite mindset sets these long distance just causes that help focus us and give us a direction, especially when we face blockages. Yeah, and he talks about blockages, but the truth is that entrepreneurship, there are always challenges, right? So like, that's the whole goal, is make this bigger than you, and make it, and again, a lot of times in my programs, I would say, you do a draft right now, we're gonna come back to the vision at the end, because you're gonna make those decisions after the fact with all the data that we go through. But here's a fun exercise, just write this down. If you were a car today, your business was a car today, what car would it be? Write it down. And if you want to take, what car in the future do you want your car to be? I have multiple exercises like this because I think it's really important for you guys to visualize, you know, hey, I want to go from a Toyota to a Tesla. What does that mean? That means innovation. That means X. That means Y. How are you going to do that? Gets you to think about it differently. So think about it real quick. I'm going to give you like 30 seconds. If you were a car today, what car would you be? If you're a car in the future, what would that look like? Easy exercise. So this is again just to get you started to think that all I want to do for you today. I'm giving you three pretty high level concepts. The next one is going to be around niche positioning. Um, so 
you guys want to know what the first step to the Holy Grail of Growth is? I'm assuming yes. <laughs> so let's start with what it's not. It's not throwing money at a problem. It's not throwing more technology at it. It's not throwing more people at it. It's not throwing more social media at it. No offense, Kurt, a social Kurt back there who runs, you know, our social media. It's not throwing more processes at it. But at first, can somebody do a drum roll? Oh, you're so good. Okay, anybody know the Batman thing? <laughs> da -da 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 it's Batman. Why am I saying that? Why is Batman the holy grail of growth? Because think about what Batman did. I called him the king of positioning. He created a sign in the sky for Gotham City, specifically the commissioner and the police folks, to say, hey, if there's ever trouble in Gotham City, call me. I got you. I got you. Any crime, I got you. And if I can't do it by myself, I got Robin, I got Wonder Woman, or whoever else comes on that side. I don't know if that was moral. I'm bad at that stuff. But you see what I'm saying? This is what you need to do for your business. You need to have your bat signal. So people know when to come to you and when not to. And when not to. Right? Companies need to find your bat signal. Prove a niche positioning that you can own uniquely. Nobody else can put the bat signal in the sky. And you know, nobody else can do that. That's his. So according to um, Harvard Business Review, businesses that have a clearly defined niche and strong positioning in the market massively outperform the vigil in almost every way. We're talking revenue, we're talking growth, retention, et cetera, et cetera. Did you want to take a picture? Sorry. Go yeah. for it. Go ahead. Go for it. You're welcome. And see, this is like what great CEOs do differently. That's exactly what it is. They niche and they position. Right? And so what does this mean? A position of active, uh, activity that particularly suits someone's talent. At the end of the day, you want to play to your strengths. You want to validate your, val you have a validated specialty for transformation. And you want to be, oh, this is an interesting one. So again, I love definitions. So when I looked at me, place in nature, the role of an organism within its natural environment that determines the relation with other organisms and it ensures its survival. So I was like, wow. It's like you want to be the solution for your ideal client's survival. That's how I see it. That's a niche, right? And your positioning is how your unique product or service is the best in the world at providing something that is well-defined for the customers that care. Not everybody cares. And that's okay. You're not serving everybody anymore. Right? Um, I just want you to think about how less stressful it would be if you could be running a business that was highly targeted People that actually cared what you were looking for, they were seeking you out. You had the transformation that you can provide them, right? And they're happy to pay the fee. That's the key. They're happy to pay because they need you in their lives. They know that you can solve their problem. And I'm sure you see this, right? People buy commodities based on the lowest price. People buy premium based off of trust and authority. So let's play a few games. How many marketing messages do you think we see a day? <laughs> How many thousands? Thousands, thousands. You know, it's between three and 20,000 if you're in New York City. <laughs> right? It's kind of crazy. So when you think of Amazon, what do you guys think of? Slurred it out. AWS. What do they stand for? Convenience. Convenience. Okay. How about Nike? Winning. How about Starbucks? Coffee. Energy. Coffee. Energy. Coffee. How about this startup week? Uh, <laughs> opportunity. Yay! Now put your logo in that middle. What do you want to stand for? This is one of my, I love this exercise. It's an anchor, guys. You'll never forget what's my bad signal. And you should use it for your business. Please spread the word. <laughs> you know, but I like I, when I thought about this, I'm like, this is a perfect analogy, right? Um, at the end of the day, again, we're not going to go into much detail. 
my whole goal for you guys, it's not the beginning when you're like, oh, who's my ideal client? And you're trying to figure it out. In the process of unique, you're actually looking at your clients and saying, wow, who is it? Why did they come to me? Why did they, like, what did we do with them? Who paid me the most? Were we happy serving them? Did they distract us from our, like, our core? All of those things. I call it your learned niche positioning. It's learned. It's like you've had the experience, now let's own it. Who's your own ideal client? Who's your ideal client? Where do you play your strengths? That's what niche positioning is. So um, in the matter of time, because we only have a few months, I have another section. If you could just take pictures of this, I'd like you to do these exercises on your own, right? This is just a, you know, an unideal client audit, quick one. Successful marketing is attracting the people you want and repelling the people you don't. Really important for you to think about. Second thing is this your ideal client. This is a very quick analysis. Who are the top five clients who you love working with? Who are the top five that you did not? But mainly, who are the top five who made you the most? You want to make sure that that starts to recognize <laughs> The people that you love and the people that pay you the most have to reconcile. And then the last one you take a picture of is identify your ideal persona. This is really thinking about a little differently. If somebody was to walk into your office, unbeknownst to you, who would they be? Like, you know, what are their, you know, that's the ideal client. Like, literally walk in my office, I'd be so happy if they were this person. Okay, so this exercise is supposed to help you show up like an expert like you are at the end of the day, right? This is just getting you to start to see that you are qualified to create transformation in your clients' lives, right? And we just have to own who they are. This third one is around IP. Again, big concept here. But how many of you have been like, you know, if you were going to, what's a big problem recently that somebody has solved for you? I think like out of the 30s out there, I've never done this before. <laughs> it's gonna work or not. Okay, I'll, I'll use this. If you're going to a dermatologist, right? and you're, you have acne, what's the outcome you would like from that dermatologist? Clear skin. Clear skin fully, right? What if they said they have a cyst, so one person says, hey, I'll clear your skin, the other one's like, hey, I have a system that I've done over and over again. It's not only gonna give you clear skin, but it's gonna make you look like X and Y and beautiful and da 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 but it's like, you won't get it back. It will not only just clear your skin, but you won't get it back. Who would you go to? That's the point, right? It's like you want to get into the person's head so that you can focus on transformations that they're going to be like, wow, this clearly they know what they're talking about. Clearly. That's the key. Clearly, right? So when you're thinking about IP, what it's not is features and operational approach. It's your signature intellectual property that's proven that your cl ideal client is seeking. It works with personal brands, it works with uh, businesses, right? Personal brands, you see it all the time. Hey, I lost 30 pounds, now I have a system, right? There's my system to losing weight, right? In businesses, it works the same way. Hey, like that operational consultancy, they know, they, they go and say, we deliver with excellence, with, with certainty. You are doing this, we, we have a process, and they show it every time. They have a three-legged stool process. So in layman terms, you either learned it or you've earned it. That's important for you to understand. You've either learned it or you've earned it. Expertise can come in different ways. The ideal goal is that you've had consistent results with clients so that you really own it. The more you do it, the more confidence you get, the more you share it, the more you'll be out there, the more you'll be known for it. It just works like that. This is real, people, think about yourselves, right? There are a lot of choices out there. People get overwhelmed with choice. If you become that transformation for somebody with the ideal desired outcome they're looking for, you're solving their pain. And you're positioning yourself with strength. Um, so yeah, these are just examples, like Kodespa, we have skin, they, they, they coin scalable poverty alleviation. Now that's exactly how they talk about it. I have a unique method. I, I work with a ton of different types of clients. That's the methodology I use every time because it works, right? Um, a strong IP requires you to stop selling features and start selling transformations. I've been talking about that. So um, I don't want to go through this too fast. The last thing here I'll talk about for the IP is why it's important to have in your business. 
because it starts to move you, you know, I talk about the unique method being about scalability and becoming sought after. Scalability comes from stop doing projects all the time and start thinking about your business as something, especially when you're in service, right? It's so easy to do project after project, but at least when you have a framework, there's repetition. You can create standard operating procedures. You can do things. You can go deeper in people. It doesn't have to be boring and in a box. That's not what I'm saying. I get challenged every day from different types of clientele, but I'm still using a framework that works. You can be seen as an expert, as a Sherpa, again, make you unique and different, and your platform can be streamlined, uh, which is really big for your efforts of overwhelm as an entrepreneur, you know, trying to create content and do sales, and develop offers, and marketing, and operations, and play all hats when you have more of a approach. These are just, again, two other uh, examples, and we're going to close out in just a few minutes here, but you know, this is Sydney Harris. She actually Oh, yeah. 